Now so Stephanie's city walls. How do you keep a legacy alive? The year is 47 BC. A puppy snuggled into her bosom. She hugged it tightly and whispered in its ear, rubbing the furry little chin between her bejeweled forefinger and thumb. Her movements were instinctual and it brought the notice of a certain leader of ancient Rome. Plutarch tells us that Caesar asked if the women of that country did not bear children. Thus, in right princely fashion, rebuking those who squander on animals that proneness to love and loving affection, which is ours by nature, and which is due primarily to our fellow human being. Imagine if he were alive today. The high-minded nature of Plutarch's rhetoric continues on to lay out the case of the human soul being inclined to enjoy learning and observing, thereby innate in its nature to make judgment towards the usefulness or uselessness of a thing. Surely, regarding things of use, and good use at that, if one happens to choose something useless of service, we are reassured by the great master it is easy to change one's mind back again towards a thing of useful service. It is meet, therefore, Plutarch says, that we pursue what is best to the end that we may not merely regard it, but also be edified by regarding it. A color is suited to the eye if its freshness and its pleasantness as well stimulates and nourishes the vision. And so our intellectual vision must be applied to such objects as by their very charm, invite it onward to its own proper good. With the world changing at breakneck speed, how do we as artists continue developing the meaning and importance of philosophies left to settle an era's past yet needed now more than perhaps ever before. Are there any prominent contemporary art theories or philosophies driving artists to push the bounds of perceptive understanding, unveiling our reality with something beyond a lateral interpretation? Is there a school of thought that has substantive enough weight that it can be registered worldwide? It feels to me that the field is of its own accord. Each artist bringing their own individual thought rather than a disciplined sharing in mastery and developing of new stylistic responses to the times at hand. It is a technicolor meadow with all these flowers doing their own dance. Or could you say that when taking an overall summation, the collective essence of contemporary art is flatness and reformulated ideas of a very nearsighted history. Perhaps the modernists were the same, each artist with their own idea, formulating their individual practices around the things they thought were key to understanding the world around them. Though, they had the more structured tradition of schools to keep them together. Their artistry and camaraderie pointing their art towards something all vying to communicate their particular sense of meaning. Or is that my nostalgia creeping up on me? Piet Mondrian's ideas about distilling reality into its simplest components were reflected in the explosion of parallel interpretations by other artists working around that time, coming to grasp the nano and nuclear realities through the new field of quantum mechanics. The field, the electromagnetic field became the plane for discovery for the modernists, shedding away the flesh and getting to the skeletal elements of reality itself. Enter Naso Stephanis, whom kingmaker Leo Castelli referred to as his PM. His son Dimitri told me in private and the nickname was short for Piet Mondrian. As clear and pure as the colors are strong, the unfolding of Daphnis's ideas moves through colors, forms, and mediums to get to a truth only he was given to reveal. His works 
are the artifacts of that ceaseless effort to know. Just as every artist is charged with a particular angle of insight into this reality, Daphnis was also tireless in his pursuit to make it known, as he often worked seven days a week from early morning to late at night, producing numerous works each year. He had 17 solo exhibitions at Leo Castelli's gallery, third only to Jasper John's with 19 and Rochenberg with 18. Artistic athleticism, as it has been called by artists who know, there is a message that must be communicated. You cannot sleep but to know the results of your current inquiry. Daphne's turned down professorships at prestigious universities because they would take too much of his time from painting. He refused his son's requests to make paintings of only a certain size so they would be easier to move. It's an honored position held by Nassos' only boy. He persisted in building his own canvases to exert total artistic and qualitative control. He didn't work with assistants. His vision was just that, his vision. And he sought to give that to more than just those who purchased his work through the gallery. I think the time has come where art can be a part of daily life. All people should be exposed daily to the art of mural painting. When they walk on the street or go to work or sit in the park, works of art should surround them. It is this kind of continuous experience that in the long run will raise our aesthetic values to a higher level. Now so is Daphne's. The year is now 1967 CE. After working some time in New York City, Nassau Stafnis, alongside fellow artists Richard Anuskiewicz, Jason Crum, Knox Martin, Mel Pekarski, Tanya, Robert Weigand, and other notable artists from the period, established a not-for-profit called City Walls Incorporated. An early fellow of the Public Art Fund, City Walls was concerned with creating mural art to uplift their local society, those who are the daily inhabitants of the so-called art capital of the world. In those days, New York City was a far cry from the golden age of Athens, in which Pericles oversaw what is still one of the greatest single-minded efforts to let the arts lead society to its higher ideals. Sanctioned by the state, Grounded in the belief that if humans could be readily reminded of and pointed to their reason, paradise perhaps could ensue here on earth. After all, it makes sense to employ artists to make a city more aesthetically engaging with the citizenry. Yet, most of our historical references weight the scale towards propaganda used for fascistic ends. It has the potential, however, I, the duty and responsibility to be put towards the good use of promoting and sustaining a healthful humanity, guiding us ever to our higher selves, seeking more usefulness, more efficient, i.e. more elegant means of unraveling the eternal conundrums of the human condition. Maybe it was that ancient calling of his heritage, but more likely it was the sincere heart and mission of Daphnis and his fellow artists that new art is for the betterment of humanity, not just the enjoyment of a few select humans. The consideration that went into choosing the locations around the city make clear these artists' intention of making visually striking art accessible to all, or as many as possible, selecting for the architecture and orientation, creating works of art meant to positively charge the environment through color and form. Daphnis completed three of the more than 50 murals sponsored by City Walls, one on Madison Avenue and West 26th Street in 1969, a convergence or divergence of circles. 
A local resident said she used to sit in Madison Square Park every morning and watch the rays of sunrise fall on its easterly facing plane as it reflected its own sunrise back down at her. Another, facing the West Side Highway on West 47th Street in 1971, as explained to me by Dimitri Daphnis, is like a guiding star from Nassos's star series, meant to designate New York City as the shining beacon of hope through art to the world, as it was proclaimed to be. It was not lost on Nassos, the metaphorical gauntlet throne during the presidential term of Ronald Reagan when the intrepid air carrier was moved to port in the harbor directly across the West Side Highway from this Northern Star. It highlighted the long-standing back and forth between the sword and the pen, so to speak. While many were pleased with the surge of public arts, not all of the press was positive. In a 1972 review, New York Times writer John Canaday disparagingly referred to City Walls as a do-gooder organization, suggesting that City Walls should change its name to City Eyesores and accusing the group of blatantly obstreperous violations of the elementary principles of mural design, scaled and patterned to overpower or obliterate their surroundings rather than pull them into some kind of harmony. Another review in 1975, also in the New York Times by writer Brian Huggins, was less scrutinizing about their motives but focused more on the perfunctory cost and executive concerns of the three different groups working around public murals, namely City Arts, City Walls, and Jamaica Art Mobilization, of which City Walls was the most ambitious. But he overlooked entirely their aim to increase the standard of living through aesthetics. The third of Daphnis's murals was actually painted along the skeletal structure of a new high-rise being built on West 43rd Street in 1972. It was a beautiful, diagonal, rainbow-esque encircling of cement supports, the bottom of the work painted by a female artist known simply as Tanya. Nassos Daphnis said himself about the project, you see, here we started with an existing form, it was not fluid at all, but was more concrete. And it's true. After their artistic rendering, the building seems to be in motion, even though it is clearly standing still. With the bright colors chosen clearly to uplift, along with the pattern of design, it is a very clear example of color theory and design principles used to create a certain feeling when looked upon. Of course, it makes sense when looking at the images now, almost 50 years later, what the artists hoped to achieve. A city where its art status is not withheld among the upper echelons of society, but shared by all to benefit the whole city. It begs the question, what if the scale and overarching vision of city walls had been maintained? more so than murals designed mainly to remember important members of the community, a broader scope of work with the Periclean ideology that could have led to a more comprehensive city health program. We could have seen the exploitation of vast wall real estate from the subway tunnels to the tops of buildings. Perhaps it could have even determined a more engaging style of skyscrapers. Who knows what could have been? Unfortunately, that was not the case. City Walls negotiated with the building owners to leave the murals only for five years. Some were painted over by advertisements, others were allowed to fall into disrepair, others still were covered by new buildings unconcerned with preserving the cultural sites. At one point, Nassau Stephanie's even phoned his friend then Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts to complain that the 47th Street mural was going to be painted over by an advertisement. Kennedy agreed it was a regrettable fate and proposed legislation to protect and preserve public art projects, but it did not pass. 
the city moved on, Daphne's moved on, but the legacy remains. The seed planted then, gone into hibernation and buried deep in the historical memoirs of the city's serried pages, was picked up again by a young gallerist who bumped into his destiny when he rented the ground floor of Daphnis's Soho studio for a pop-up gallery. Richard Taitonger, yes, of the French Champagne family, followed his heart from childhood away from the family business and into the art world. From an experience at an auction house in France that moved him as a child, to completing a Christie's education course in New York City, the year is now 2010, when Richard meets Dimitri and Artemis Daphnis, Nassau Daphnis' son and daughter. Something of an immediate kindred spirit was found. Three years later, Richard would open his namesake gallery at 154 Ludlow Street in the Lower East Side. Three years after that, Richard, Dimitri, and Artemis finalized talks for Richard's gallery to represent the Nassau Stephanie's estate. The year is now 2018, and the world is about to change. Nassau Stephanie's has had three solo shows at the Richard Tatonje Gallery. The United States has already gone through unprecedented experiences with the presidency of Donald Trump. But in 2020, when COVID hits, the world is in for an even deeper shock. Markets turned upside down. The ugly inequities of a highly stratified global economy coming into even sharper relief with the uncertainty of war, the perils of global warming, as if the world itself is on fire, on the edge of daylight or a long, cold night. So what better time to remind ourselves of a geometric sun some thought had set. City Walls, the fourth solo exhibition of Nassau Stephanie's at the Richard Tatonje Gallery is picking back up the beacon. The show opened with an explosion of Nassau Stephanie's three city walls period artworks, shining brightly from the northern and southern walls sending exuberant life out to the street-facing, floor-to-ceiling windows of the gallery. Like cells of new life dividing in three eight-foot by eight-foot canvases, built by Daphnis's own hands, the colors look as if they were painted yesterday, not some 50 years ago. The lower ceiling throughway in the gallery sees a series of epoxy stars in different processions, as of dancing toward the back room that has a nine-work dialogue. They are truly nourishing to the soul. The brightness and crispness of the lines, the universal shapes that create volume and dimension on a flat surface, and the indelible skill of Daphnis's precision. Lines so straight, even a computer would blush. A suggestion to those not familiar with color theory or platonic solids, do a little reading before you view his work so you can understand beyond the good feeling what Nassos is trying to tell us. By the prolific nature of his work, and as addressed before, we know he had something he was communicating. But just like the life of a democracy depends on an educated public, so does a healthy society require an aesthetically educated public so as to direct the social order towards those higher pursuits of intellect and not the lowest common denominator of commodity exchange. The exhibition itself is a harbinger of more to come as a city walls like project in Athens, Greece was just announced in a press release sent by Mayor Kostas Bakoyanis of Athens after two years of talks. In 2023, Nassos Daphnis' art will travel back to his first homeland to uplift the city that is forever recognized as the birth mother of democracy, the original beacon of cultural enlightenment that blesses and eludes society at our whim. Let us hope that this is just the beginning of a new golden age of art, where it is returned from a plaything of the ultra mega rich, where it is largely misused to uphold a self-stated importance overlooking the broader good of humanity 
and return to its truest aim of educating the public of their importance and their duty to reason, thereby abiding by the natural laws laid out ever eloquently by Kantian philosophy as organized around a notion of categorical imperative, a scale of usefulness, if you will, which is a universal ethical principle stating that one should always respect the humanity and others and that one should only act in accordance with rules that could hold for everyone. Kant argued that the moral law is a truth of reason, and hence that all rational creatures are bound by the same moral law. Thus, in answer to the question, what should I do? Kant replies, we should act rationally in accordance with a universal moral law. So we see from Plutarch to Kant, it is by our nature that we are duty bound to seek the best for ourselves and all humanity. Nassau Staphnis reminded us of one of the most efficient means to do so is through art. Daphnis and the City Walls not-for-profit showed society once again that by creating public arts using color, form, and objective beauty, the quality of life can be elevated for all. By applying Kant's ideal of moral law as a truth of reason, society would reason to do the right thing by means of directing its plans by the measurable service of good use towards the promotion and sustaining of a healthful humanity. As Pericles once said, our love of what is beautiful does not lead to extravagance. Our love of the things of the mind does not make us soft. While the debate may continue on what Pericles meant by mind, in my school of practice, neo-illusion, the mind is not the brain. The mind is the essence of the soul and it is that soul which drives us to seek the best. So to reach the best, we must gather our collective mind to face the hard lines of reality. We must keep turning and turning as Daphnis did throughout his career, ever striving for the perfection of the answer, though it be forever just out of reach. It is that striving which is the glory of this life. Like the intended meaning, of Nassau Stephanie's West 47th Street Guiding Star.